Hello and welcome to Food Safety Fridays, edition 128. It's the penultimate Food Safety Friday before the end of the year. Uh, the good news is we've got uh, already finalising the programme for next year. We've got another 29 Food Safety Fridays next year. But for now, for today, uh, it's uh, the subject sanitary design. It's not a subject we've covered before. And that's with Daniel Wu from AIB International. Um, just a few things to point out. Yeah, say hello in the sidebar. Um, tell us where you're calling us from today, where you're joining us from. Uh, you're all very welcome. Uh, it is being recorded today, and as ever, all registrants will receive an email afterwards with the recording, the slide deck, and the certificate of attendance. Um, please save your questions until the end of the presentation, otherwise they just scroll away and we miss them. So you will be sort of wasting your time, and we don't want that. Uh, Food Safety Fridays is sponsored. Um, without the sponsors, we wouldn't be here. So uh, I'm going to play their ads now, as I do each week. A uh, couple of minutes, and I'll be back and introduce you to Daniel. The world of food has changed a lot in the last hundred years. But one thing that doesn't change? Ensuring the quality and safe handling of food. No matter what changes are yet to come, we're proud to always be on our client's side, shaping the future of food today and tomorrow. AIB International, ever onward. Oh. There we go. Thanks to uh, the sponsors there. I hope you enjoyed those videos. Um, next to me here, Daniel Wu. Nice to have you along, Daniel. Morning. Good <laughs> afternoon or uh, good evening, everyone. Um, could you just tell us where you're joining us from today, Daniel? Sure. I am joining uh, you guys here from beautiful Colorado. We got some lovely winter weather going on, so it certainly sets the mood for the uh, holiday season. And as usual, I'm in Manchester in the UK, where it's permanent drizzle and rain. But anyway, uh, let's get the presentation up. I'll be joining in with some polls, and I'll be back for the Q&A as well. But for now, I'll hand you over to Daniel. You can switch your webcam off, Daniel. Okay. All right. So, uh, as uh, Simon introduced me, my name is Dan Wu, and I work in the quality assurance department of uh, AIB International. 
So today we got a, a lot of a lot of things to go over, but I wanted to spend some time uh, really discussing sanitary design and how it can be utilized as a proactive approach to ensuring the safety of food products. So before we get started, uh, I'd like to offer a brief introduction to AIB International for those of you who may be unfamiliar. For 100 years, AIB International has been committed to partnering with our clients to ensure the enjoyment of safe, high quality food everywhere. Through customized training, inspections, consulting, regulatory, and certification services, our global team of food safety and quality professionals in 120 countries helps our customers address virtually every link in their supply chain. That's because we believe everyone deserves safe, high quality food and continue to share our insights and expertise with the industry to help make that a reality. So to start this presentation, we're going to discuss how sanitary design has become a topic of focus, uh, particularly as foodborne illness outbreaks and recalls continue to be at the forefront of our industry. And next, we'll talk about how to be proactive when it comes to preventing the contamination of food products through implementing design standards for building and grounds, equipment and tools, as well as providing accessibility for detailed inspection and cleaning. So why is sanitary design so important? Uh, despite advances in food safety technology and processing techniques, foodborne illness outbreaks are still occurring and show a need to go back to basics. Worldwide, the World Health Organization estimates 420,000 deaths a year resulting from the consumption of contaminated food. Uh, according to the Centers for Disease Control, in 2017 alone, 841 foodborne disease outbreaks were reported in the United States, resulting in 14,481 illnesses, 827 hospitalizations, and 20 deaths. Again, these are just numbers of uh, foodborne illnesses that get reported, which are just a fraction of the estimates of actual illnesses. Uh, next, a joint industry study by the Food Marketing Institute and Grocery Manufacturers Association estimates the average cost of a recall for food companies to be 10 million US dollars in addition to brand damage and lost sales. Many regulatory agencies are aware of the positive impact that sanitary design can have on food safety and have thus included it as part of regulatory requirements. Third-party audit schemes have also incorporated sanitary design into their standards, and auditors have been and will continue to evaluate if sanitary design requirements have been established and effectively implemented. Uh, when it comes to the return on investment for sanitary design, it's really important to note that the cost of purchasing or renovating equipment and structures does not always reflect its value as a well-designed and manageable asset. Having sanitary design principles incorporated from the beginning allows for personnel to spend less time on a piece of equipment that is difficult to clean or disassemble or structures that are hard to reach and allows them more time to address other sanitation concerns. This can lead to more effective, effective labor usage and ultimately a safer end product for the consumer. So let's dive further into the regulatory interest for sanitary design. Uh, according to a recent study published by the U.S. Public Interest Research Group, the amount of food recalls uh, in the United States have increased 10% from 2013 to 2018. Here on this slide, uh, we have the FDA's fifth annual reportable foods registry report. And as you can see, the most common reason for recall still remains as undeclared allergens. However, it is closely followed by contamination concerns from environmental pathogens such as salmonella, salmonella and listeria monocytogenes at 44% of all recalls. So what does this mean? So although, although some of the increase in recalls may be due to modern detection technology and a more complex food supply chain, it also means that there will continue to be a strong regulatory push for food facilities to be proactive when it comes to the safe manufacturing of food rather than reactive 
as when you issue a recall, it indicates that a food safety failure has already occurred. So to enforce this proactive approach, sanitary design is addressed as part of the FDA's current good manufacturing practices, which is now a subpart of the preventative controls rule of FSMA. Uh, specifically in 21 CFR 117.20, the regulations require plants to be suitable in size, construction, and design to facilitate maintenance and sanitary operations for food production purposes. Additionally, 21 CFR 117.40 states that all plant equipment and utensils used in manufacturing, processing, packing, or holding food must be designed of, and be of such material and workmanship to be adequately cleanable and must be adequately maintained to protect allergen against allergen cross-contact and contamination. So now that we have gone over the two major clauses that deal with sanitary design, how many times do you guys think that these uh, clauses have been cited by the FDA during their investigations of food facilities in the last three years? Yep, yeah, I've loaded the poll in the sidebar. Hopefully you can see that under the poll tab, uh, Dan. Uh, yeah. In the past three years, how many times have these two clauses been cited by the FDA during their investigations of food facilities? 50 times. 100 times, 200 times, or over 600 times. Uh, so please vote. Um, and let's see how it shapes up. Uh, the majority, they about roughly 58, 57 percent, 600 times, over 600 times, and then 25 percent, 200 times, and then 100 times, 15 percent, and nobody, 50 times. So. Go on, put us out of our misery, Dan. Yeah, well, you guys got, uh, the majority of you got the uh, right answer, which is over 600 times. In fact, uh, if you put, pull up the inspection uh, database, the citation database, it's actually 672 as of November 2019. So the main takeaway we're trying to push here is that regulatory agencies are not going to hesitate to cite issues in relation, in relation with inadequate sanitary design at a facility. So in order to sur surpass regulatory expectations and provide safe food, sanitary design must be treated as a fundamental prerequisite program. So although many of us may be familiar with food regulations, at the end of the day, it's the responsibility of the facility to verify that their equipment and structures have incorporated sanitary design principles and are not providing a long-term harbage environment for microbes. So to do so, it's important to consider environmental monitoring as an early warning tool, as well as being aware of the difference between transient and resident microorganisms. So as you know, bacteria have many routes of being introduced into the processing environment, such as from coming in with your raw materials, being tracked in by personnel or contaminated equipment, or even being brought in by pests. These type of microorganisms are known as transient microorganisms. Generally, the implementation of proper cleaning and sanitation procedures should be adequate in controlling transient bacteria in the processing facility. However, if microorganisms make its way into harbage locations, such as cracks, holes, crevices, or hard to clean areas in the food processing environment, it could lead to the bacteria setting up shop and becoming well protected. So once an environmental pathogen has become a resident strain, there is a persistent contamination risk in the facility and intense sanitation will be needed to address the concern. Uh, here in the United States, the FDA is aware of the harm that resident pathogens can cause in a food facility and have thus implemented an increased focus on environmental monitoring as part of the preventative controls rule. Using an analytical method called whole genome sequencing, the FDA has the capability to determining if a specific genomic strain of a microorganism has established residence based on samples collected from multiple inspections, otherwise known as swabathons. So in a recent warning that was posted to the public by the FDA, the FDA stated the following for a food manufacturer. Laboratory analysis of the environmental swabs found the presence of Listeria monocytogenes, 
a human pathogen in your facility, including the same strain found during the FDA's 2017 and 2018 inspections. Based on the inspectional findings and the analytical results for the environmental samples, we have determined that the food manufactured in your facility are adulterated within the meaning of Section 402A4 of the Federal FDC Act and that they were prepared, packed, or held under insanitary conditions whereby they may have been rendered injurious to health. The presence of the same strain of Listeria monocytogenes over multiple years indicates that there has been a resident pathogen or harbored site in your facility since 2017. So th this is a great example of how the FDA is uh, leveraging its regulatory authority against those facilities who don't implement effective design and sanitation measures to address microbial harborage. So now that we've discussed the concern with resident microorganisms, let's briefly go over how microorganisms can harbor in food plants for prolonged periods of time through the formation of biofilms. So uh, a biofilm is a mass of microorganisms in which cells stick to each other and are enclosed in a highly protective extracellular substance. The formation of biofilms typically involves five stages. The first stage begins with the attachment of free-floating bacteria uh, to a surface. If the surface does not get properly cleaned or sanitized, uh, perhaps due to the uh, bacteria finding a niche, uh, the next stage is irreversible attachment. The biofilm grows through a process of cell division and these uh, cells stick to each other and to a surface with the aid of a self-produced extracellular substance. Over a period of time, if the harbage area isn't addressed, these bonds are strengthened and it makes the uh, attachment irreversible. Once the uh, extra, extracellular substance is formed, the third stage of bacterial growth and multiplication will occur. And in the fourth stage, uh, the biofilm develops into an organized resilient st structure which displays a multifold resistance to cleaning chemicals and sanitizers. And finally, uh, the most important uh, or most important stage of concern is dispersion. So once uh, the biofilm is completely established, then the bacterial cells are released from the, su from the surface, leading to cross-contamination of the product or environment. So due to the resilient characteristics of uh, resident microorganisms, it's really important, guys, to seek out and eliminate harborage areas and verify the appropriateness of your sanitary design principles through an aggressive environmental monitoring program. So based on what we just reviewed on uh, biofilms and resident microorganisms, when do you guys think would be the appropriate time frame for environmental swaps to be taken? Okay, I've uh, loaded the poll in the sidebar. Um, just to reiterate, when is the recommended time frame for environmental swaps to be taken? Possible answers, right after sanitation, during down days, at startup, or several hours into production. Um, okay, so let's see. Uh, the majority, are, uh, over 50%, are saying several hours into production, and then around 30% right after sanitation, 18% at startup, and then during down days, zero. Sure. So, uh, you know, the, the majority, again, has the right answer here. So per the FDA guidance, uh, if a microorganism has established residence, taking the swab several hours into production will allow ample time for the microbe to work its way out of harborage sites. This is actually going to give you the most accurate representation of the actual contamination risk to your product during a production run. So if bacteria are present, they're going to be coming out of their harbor sites uh, due to normal operational and equipment movement. If you take it right after sanitation, however, the sanitizer might still be present and lead to negative results. So now let's transition over to sanitary design considerations for your facility. Um, the outside grounds, uh, it's the first impression that a visitor or even a regulatory inspector will have of your facility. 
oftentimes when I'm conducting audits, uh, if I get the opportunity, I like to drive around the site and uh, get an overall feel for the uh, facility's food safety practices before I walk in the door. So it makes sense that maintaining a sanitary food processing environment should start with the outside of the facility. To quote the old adage of real estate agents, location, 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 it's extremely important. Uh, neighboring properties should be evaluated to ensure that they do not have conditions that promote pest development. You know, for example, rundown buildings or neighboring properties with excessive litter and debris could be an issue. You know, work with your neighbors and uh, let them know how their conditions could impact the food safety of your site. You know, I was actually uh, inspecting a warehouse last year and, uh, you know, the, the couple months before the, the audit, they found out that their neighboring uh, recycling site was going to get demolished. So, you know, they jumped on the issue. They worked with their pest service provider. They increased the service frequencies. Uh, they worked with the landlord. They actually got a bunch of uh, additional exterior rodent bait stations and snap traps uh, set up along the fence line. And uh, it turns out they wound up capturing or killing over hundreds of rodents. Uh, and the most remarkable uh, part about that is when you look at their pest service records, none of those rodents actually made its way into the facility. So having that proactive approach, uh, really knowing your surroundings, knowing your environment, can and does make a positive impact. Uh, so anyways, uh, Improper landscaping uh, is uh, the next point we want to talk about. It certainly could lead to issues uh, in terms of pest development. Uh, tall grass, bushes, trees, and other vegetation create great hiding places for pests. Uh, routine landscaping service, uh, routine landscaping service. Sorry about that. Uh, could help keep these uh, these items well maintained and can have a profound impact at reducing pest populations. Whenever planting newer vegetation, it's also important guys to consider their growth potential. For example, a uh, newly planted tree may not be much of an issue right now, but however, as time goes on, its branches could grow over the roof and provide an access point on top of your facility for uh, squirrels and rats. Uh, steps should also be taken to uh, eliminate water sources. Well-maintained yards, drives, and parking lots must be prioritized as part of uh, the exterior design. Having the grounds and paved area slope towards storm sewer inlets can really help preventing standing water from becoming a breeding area for pests. Improperly managed waste can also lead to microbial and pest issues. Uh, eliminating accessible food sources should be the main priority when managing waste. Trash containers and compactors should be covered and frequently serviced. And also placing the uh, trash containers on concrete pads or paved areas can really help in keeping its surrounding area clean. Uh, let's talk about lighting next. Um, outside lighting, as you guys know, is essential for determining deterring criminal acts at night and also ensuring outside activities can be conducted safely. However, uh, consideration must be given to where these lights are placed. For example, placing a light over a dock door could lead to insect attraction into your facility. Instead, if at all possible, lights should be positioned away from the building and pointed towards areas that will need to be illuminated as an alternative. Using lights that emit fewer UV rays, such as sodium vapor lights or LED lights, are worth the consideration as lights with higher amounts of UV tend to attract flying insects. Uh, roofs should not be overlooked for sanitary design principles as well when it comes to the outside grounds. Uh, many food manufacturing facilities have a lot of air intake units and exhaust stacks positioned on the roof, and raw material lines certainly could be uh, present on the roof as well, which could lead to product spills that are highly attractive to birds and rodents. That's why uh, pitch and gravel roofs aren't recommended for food processing facilities, as it would make cleanup very difficult. Instead, uh, membrane roofs are preferred, as they are an easier surface to clean. Uh, that being said, care must be taken not to damage these membrane roofs, uh, during maintenance and sanitation activities. All it takes, guys, is a few nails, screws, or other sharp objects to be left behind and accidentally stepped on 
uh, to cause damage that will eventually lead to roof leaks inside your facility. So a good recommendation would be to have a designated reinforced walkway with pads to help protect it from this type of damage. And as with any exterior grounds, it's, all import it's also important to have adequate drainage on the roof as leftover rainwater could also cause pest attraction. So although maintaining exterior grounds can deter pest attraction to your facility and overall lower pest levels, uh, effective barriers will still be your facility's main defense at preventing these pests from getting into the building. Utilizing a, a pest control company at your site won't prevent pest issues if doors are left open and the facility is not adequately pest proof. So not only should doors, windows and other openings be close fitting to less than a quarter inch or six millimeters to help discourage pest development, but also doing so will help to prevent dust and debris from entering the facility as well. Although the, uh, the effectiveness of mechanical ventilation systems should not be overlooked, if doors or windows need to be kept open for ventilation, then these openings should be provided with a screen, uh, preferably 16 mesh or smaller, with consideration given to heavier gauge mesh screens that are located within three feet of the ground to prevent rodents from chewing through the material. And as we discussed earlier, exterior lights should not be mounted over doors as uh, this arrangement could certainly uh, increase the attraction of flying insects into your facility. When it comes to the interior of the facility, the most important goal is to prevent cross-contamination to food products. To do so, hygienic zoning should be considered. Uh, to explain simply, guys, hygienic zoning is the uh, practice of dividing a food manufacturing facility into defined zones based on the potential risk of cross-contamination. So this can be done using uh, barriers or physical separations for each zone, uh, through the use of specific hygienic practices needed in each area before proceeding into a different zone, uh, providing foot sanitizers or even a captive shoe program uh, in transition areas, or even uh, restricting personnel and equipment traffic between raw areas and uh, ready-to-eat processing locations. Uh, a good example of hygienic zoning would be in a poultry processing plant in which raw areas and cooked ready-to-eat areas are physically separated from one another, with distinct equipment, utensils, outer garments, and personnel dedicated to each area. Uh, controlling airflow within the facility also helps to prevent the spread of contamination. Production areas and particularly ready-to-eat areas should have positive air pressure. So what does this mean? It means when you open the door, you should feel air rushing out. As a general guideline, uh, a slightly positive pressure situation will exist when the supply air is approximately 10% greater than the exhaust air. Also, air supplied to the facility should be adequately filtered to remove pests and dust. Uh, typically, filters should be rated to remove particles of at least 50 microns in size or smaller. However, uh, more stringent HEPA-style filters may be needed for higher risk processing areas. Finally, uh, restrooms should be equipped with functional exhaust fans that discharge to the outside with self-closing doors, so to prevent the spread of aerosolized bacteria. So the building structure that takes more abuse than any other area is uh, obviously the floor. I mean, think about the amount of forklift traffic, personnel movement, and other equipment that goes over floors, along with its constant exposure to water, chemicals, and spilled products. Uh, as such, floors are at a consistent risk of deterioration and damage. Uh, pitted, cracked, or delaminated flooring allows for debris to work its way into the crevices, and these types of conditions often lead to the development of microbes and pests. Furthermore, you know, badly damaged flooring just leads to a negative impression of your facility by regulatory agencies or even visitors as it's easily spotted. Therefore, the flooring needs of a, a facility should be strongly considered. For example, concrete flooring may be appropriate in a dry storage warehouse, but may not last as long in a food processing area that is cleaned with chemicals and exposed to other conditions uh, such as steam or uh, even frying oil. 
So when repairing or installing new flooring, it's important to work with the manufacturer and installer to ensure that the chosen flooring material will be compatible with the specific operating and sanitation parameters of the area. Uh, in addition to flooring selection, the importance of proper surface preparation and adequate installation time cannot be overemphasized, as failing to do so can really negate the, uh, the advertised benefits of the flooring material and eventually cause headaches down the road. So let's talk about sanitary flooring criteria. Uh, flooring should be impervious, resistance to, resistant to chemicals from cleaning, and overall easy to maintain, easy to clean. Uh, common choices in the industry are epoxy, vinyl ester, or urethane coated flooring options as they meet the criteria for uh, durable flooring. Uh, brick and tile flooring may also be uh, more common in older facilities, so grout upkeep should definitely be prioritized as missing grout could lead to harbage areas for microbes and pests. Uh, vinyl and linoleum tiles should be limited to administrative and employee areas as the material can scratch and stain easily and it's just difficult to maintain a good bond between the material and the substrate below. Uh, drains. Uh, as you know, drains are a hot spot for microbial harborage as they're consistently exposed to water and food residues. Every effort needs to be made to ensure drains are free flowing and that floors are sloped towards drains to prevent standing water. Standing water leads to uh, an increased contamination risk for a facility as the moisture can allow for the rapid growth of microbes and can get tracked all over the place through uh, operational movement. Also, there should be uh, separate drainage systems for toilet facilities and processing areas to prevent, to prevent any backflow issues. Uh, covers for drains, they should be easily removable to allow for regular inspecting and cleaning. And not only that, guys, but the location of drains uh, in relation to equipment should be considered. You know, in my uh, inspection travels, I've seen several instances where food processing equipment is positioned directly over the drains, which again leads to the question, how do these drains get cleaned effectively? So <clears throat> circular one-piece stainless steel drains with catch baskets are preferred as they can be easily serviced. Trench, trench drains, on the other hand, can be a, a bit more difficult to maintain due to the increased surface area as well as issues with the grouting and sealing of the trench drains. There also could be an issue during sanitation as you know personnel may incidentally hit it with uh, high pressure water and cause the aerosolization of bacteria. So if tr trench drains are going to be used in the process, it's really important to limit their depth to allow for uh, effective cleaning and that they be adequately sloped to prevent standing water. Uh, walls, uh, it's another surface that needs to be durable, smooth, and easy to clean. Uh, preferred wall materials include heavy concrete, uh, epoxy coated surfaces, and structural insulated panels with uh, laminate coatings. When selecting wall materials, uh, consideration should be given for the repairability of the surface as wear occurs over time. Wall floor junctions are subject to the most abuse, as you guys know, especially from air, uh, forklift and uh, equipment movement. Damage to the wall floor junctions should immediately be repaired because uh, you don't really want an area where pests could uh, easily harbor. Also, uh, wall floor junctions should be rounded or coved and uh, appropriately sealed in order to allow for the effective removal of debris. Uh, ceilings in a food facility should uh, not be overlooked as well, uh, especially in areas where it's uh, directly over product zones as certainly there's a foreign material risk there. As such, uh, overhead ceilings should be constructed uh, or made of durable materials that will not chip or flake. Smooth sealed concrete ceilings or permanent drop ceilings with water resisting paneling are uh, common choices. Ceiling joists and uh, corrugated metal ceilings are not easily cleanable as these surfaces often collect dust and food debris and can lead to insect development, uh, certainly. 
Uh, furthermore, uh, metal panel ceilings uh, could cause condensation problems in your facility. Uh, painted ceilings should be avoided as well. Uh, peeling paint flakes can easily contaminate product. Uh, Non-load bearing false ceiling panels are not also uh, are not recommended as well as the voids are difficult to clean and inspect. And when they're opened by personnel from below, uh, any accumulated dust and debris can get dispersed into the production area. Furthermore, they're they're not always resealed properly, and any unprotected openings to the ceiling void uh, can certainly be an issue. You know, as an inspector, false ceiling panels automatically perk our curiosity. You know, when we take a ladder and go up there, uh, you name it, we've seen it, whether it be rodent droppings or cockroaches or decomposed mice or uh, product debris. You know, in fact, uh, the last bakery I was at, uh, they were dealing with a pretty significant meal moth issue uh, in their Dell makeup area, which was uh, pretty unusual. So, uh, you know, we talked to the facility and they were, you know, increasing their uh, fogging services from their contracted pest control provider. They put additional pheromone lures up to see where it could be coming from, but, you know, it wasn't really helping with the numbers and they really couldn't pinpoint uh, what was going on. So, you know, during the inspection, we're walking around and take a look up and you look at their uh, light fixtures next to their uh, drop down ceiling panels and sure enough, there's a uh, moth activity. So I uh, grabbed a ladder, uh, climbed up, uh, moved the ceiling panel, and there it was. Uh, insect trails, excess flower debris, uh, live larvae, dead larvae, caskins, uh, moths. Uh, there was a, a breeding condition going on up there. And the, uh, the funny thing was we take a look at their master cleaning schedule, and it says that they're going to get up there monthly and uh, do a detailed clean. But when you look at the actual records, they weren't doing it for the last several months. So the takeaway here is if something's hard to clean, something's hard to access, it's not very likely that personnel are going to actually do the cleaning task. Uh, other overhead structures of concern include water pipes and air handling units. Uh, if at all possible during the design phase of a facility, these apparatuses should not be positioned over product zones. Uh, the cool surfaces on these structures could easily allow for the development of condensation. Uh, overhead pipes should also be insulated, uh, with care taken to insulate the entire pipe and not to miss areas where the pipes are supported on hangers. Uh, dehumidifiers and adequate airflow must also be considered uh, for air handling units as a preventative measure against condensation development as well. Uh, next, care must be taken when catwalks or uh, access platforms are provided over or near product zones. Specifically, any allergenic debris or moisture could get kicked or swept down towards uh, your food products if there aren't any tow guards or uh, kick plates in place. Uh, another uh, inspection tip to, to share is you want to check to make sure that the tow guards are installed in a flush manner with the uh, platform as we've seen this aspect overlooked in several plants and the gap, uh, the resulting gap could certainly be a contamination risk. So previously uh, plants may have looked at reducing or cutting back on the amount of lighting to save on costs. but Nowadays, great energy savings can be realized through the use of high efficiency lighting such as LED lights. And I've been to facilities where they upgraded their lighting over the years and it really does make a difference. Uh, a well-lit processing area not only brightens up the, the plant and increases morale, but it also allows personnel to easily inspect their areas for any cleaning issues, pests, and for foreign materials. Uh, I also advise as a best practice that employees in charge of pre-operational inspections and sanitation activities be provided with a flashlight so they can do a, a detailed inspection. Uh, finally, lighting fixtures in a food processing facility should be shatter resistant or protected with uh, shielding in order to prevent glass breakage and dispersion as glass, as you guys know, is quite the hazardous form of foreign materials and it could certainly trigger a class one recall if a breakage over a product zone goes unnoticed. Electrical systems, uh, they're a great harbage area for pests and can become a cleaning challenge if they become hard to access. Uh, electrical conduits, if they're going to be uh, 
they're going to be used, they need to be well sealed where they enter the plant to prevent them from being an ingress point for uh, pests. Conduits that are placed along the walls should either be completely sealed to the wall or provided spacers in order to access behind the panel for uh, cleaning. Uh, electrical panels in food processing areas should be well sealed and they should also be on a defined cleaning schedule. Too often these, electron, uh, the, these electrical panels go unchecked and uh, it could lead to insect development as we often find uh, these issues inside these panels during our inspections. So when purchasing food contact equipment and utensils, it's not only important to evaluate the makeup of the, uh, makeup of the materials, but also the intrinsic characteristics of the food as well, as well as the uh, type of sanitation chemicals that will be used. Not spending the necessary time on this evaluation could lead to eventual equipment failures and sanitation problems down the road. The desirable design principles, you know, it should be non-toxic, smooth, non-porous and uh, easy to clean. Uh, food contact materials should, should certainly be durable as well. This not only means that they should resist pinning and chipping, but they should be able to withstand typical cleaning, cleaning chemicals that will be used during the uh, sanitation process. So the most common types of materials for in the industry for food contact applications are stainless steel, uh, ultra high weight molecular plastic, and uh, rubber. As you know, stainless steel is widely used in our industry as it's resistant to corrosion and can stand up to most cleaning chemicals. However, it's really advised to uh, double check with the equipment manufacturer on the recommended method of cleaning as the use of harsh chemicals and abrasive pads over time can cause excessive scratching, which can even lead to a potential niche area. Uh, UHMW plastic is also a popular choice as it's resistant to stains, uh, has low friction, and can uh, handle cleaning chemicals uh, as well. Uh, some materials that should be avoided for food contact surfaces include cadmium, chromium, and uh, galvanized iron. Uh, cadmium is considered to be toxic. Uh, chromium can flake. Uh, galvanized iron can have its uh, zinc coating breakdown. Uh, copper bearing alloys are not advised as they can react with acidic foods and not only cause off odors but uh, may even discolor the food or uh, cause a toxic reaction. Wood is not an ideal choice for a uh, food contact surface either as uh, splinters can form and become a source of foreign materials. Uh, wood is certainly not recommended for wet foods as it can easily absorb the liquids. However, if it's needed for the process, process maybe for something like an artisan bread, uh, surfaces should consist of a hard, close-grade wood, such as maple. When it comes to uh, food processing uh, equipment, and especially conveyors, uh, the preference is for an easily cleanable surface, such as a smooth thermoplastic belt with an endless seam. Uh, interlocking conveyor belts uh, tend to be a, a cleaning challenge as they have a lot of crevices and often they're simply rinsed off rather than detail cleaned and taken apart. Additionally, belts with uh, metal lace seams not only have a potential harbage area within the seam, but it can also be quite the foreign material risk as well as the uh, laces and belting material can come apart. In all cases, when uh, lacing is going to be selected, it's a good idea to choose one with uh, magnetic properties. For conveyors, uh, solid rollers should be considered rather than hollow rollers as uh, hollow rollers can be uh, another great harbage area for allergens and microbes. And in general, uh, if permanently joined surfaces of food protection, uh, food production equipment, uh, they're, they're going to need to be curved or rounded as uh, sharp corners could allow for product debris to accumulate. Sandwich surfaces, uh, hinges, latches, they're also a, a great harbage area, so it's an, really important that they be easily removable for cleaning as they're often missed. For uh, micro-sensitive products, a, a lift-off cover may be a better choice for uh, cleaning and sanitizing. Fasteners such as screws and nuts should not be present on product contact surfaces if at all possible. Not only, guys, can they uh, come loose and become a source of foreign materials, 
but they could also capture food debris. And when positioned nearby, if they're going to be used, the fastener should be smooth, free of pockets, such as within the head of the materials. They should be installed in a flush manner without crevices. Uh, the framework of food processing equipment can serve as an excellent harbage area as well. Uh, ideally, framework should be a solid piece design with minimal flat and horizontal edges. Uh, if hollow equipment framework is present, it should have its bottom end sealed off and all openings should be closed to prevent the accumulation of debris. Another consideration is movable equipment, such as ingredient and utensil carts. Uh, they really should have uh, shields on the wheels, guys, to prevent any contaminants from kicking up and uh, contaminate, contaminating what's on the cart as well. In terms of maintenance activities, uh, unhygienic welds can certainly lead to product contamination. Uh, rough, cracked, recessed, and pitted welds are notoriously difficult to clean. If welds are needed for uh, food equipment and machinery, they should be continuous and polished with any weld splatter completely removed. Uh, additionally, spot welds should not be allowed on food contact surfaces. Uh, these the, the gaps created by spot welds can certainly harbor materials. And even more difficult, the two pieces that have been spot welded uh, can't be taken apart to effectively clean the harbage area. Piping should again be uh, made of appropriate materials and should be uh, smooth and free of tack welds. Whenever uh, piping installations or modifications are, are made, it's one of the most important uh, food safety considerations is to prevent the formation of dead ends. Uh, dead ends allow for the uh, product to get trapped in an area with little or no product flow. So whenever uh, we conduct inspections in the field, uh, a dead end pipe automatically perks our curiosity to, to go and open it up, uh, especially if it's still connected to an active line. Uh, often when we open these up, guys, uh, for dry ingredients such as flour, you'll certainly see some insect activity. And for wet products such as sucrose or syrups, uh, mold and putrid odors could be uncovered as well. So uh, there's certainly a uh, significant food safety risk associated with dead ends. Ideally, uh, equipment bearings should be designed so that the apparatuses are not located over a product zone, as you can see in this picture. Uh, however, if uh, existing equipment still has bearings or even gearboxes over a product zone, they should contain food grade lubricant and also be provided with protective measures such as being completely sealed or having a catch pan. Again, having sanitary design principles incorporated from the beginning will help to prevent more cleaning tasks as when you install the catch van, it's just another apparatus that will need to be frequently taken apart and cleaned. Gaskets, uh, they should be considered as a uh, food contact surface and should be made of food grade materials. Again, this means they should be non-toxic, non-absorbent, and should not degrade due to the nature of the product or through the use of cleaning compounds. Uh, when fitting gaskets, it's a, it's a great practice to double check and make sure it's installed in a flush manner. If they protrude outwards, not only could they uh, catch access debris and harbor microbes, but it could also detach and become a so source of foreign material. Finally, uh, gaskets have a shelf life. Uh, they shouldn't be used until failure. If you already notice pieces uh, missing or uh, fraying pieces, it's already too late. Rather, gaskets should be on a, a defined PM schedule with a routine, routine change out prioritized. Accessibility. Um, as we've stressed through this presentation, if an area is hard to clean or uh, difficult to access, how likely is it going to get cleaned? Uh, Personnel are certainly going to be less motivated to spend the time to effectively clean, inspect, and maintain the, this type of equipment. So as a general rule of thumb, processing equipment should be kept off the walls and be no closer than 18 inches from the ceiling. Also, as a best practice, uh, processing equipment should be kept on supports as at least six inches off the floor to help pretend, prevent contamination concerns and also allow for the effective removal of debris. So when it comes to uh, disassembly, uh, equipment should, should never be difficult to take apart. 
Uh, if a specialized tool is needed for disassembly and it gets misplaced, it's less likely that personnel will uh, complete the cleaning task. Being able to take apart equipment with a uh, simple tool such as a screwdriver or wrench would be uh, more appropriate. Also, uh, make sure that you're working with the equipment manufacturer to know exactly what the recommended disassembly method for detail cleaning the machinery. When you personally invest in something such as a new car, uh, you would get instructions in an owner's manual on how to properly care for your new purchase. So the same should be expected when it comes to food machinery. So here in these pictures, you can see the uh, side paneling of an oven. You can see that it can be easily lifted off and removed without the need of uh, complex tools. And here's that uh, picture of that oven panel when it's taken apart. And uh, on the picture on the right, you see the a side panel of a mixer that can easily be removed with the use of knob screws. Another consideration to look at, and uh, something that you may want to talk to your equipment manufacturer about, is providing handles for panels, shields, or covers for easier removal as well. When equipment or uh, machinery wear or break down, it could often be desirable to implement a quick temporary fix so that production can resume. However, uh, to quote a popular saying in our industry, uh, there's nothing more permanent than the temporary repair. So to prevent this, uh, work orders for permanent repairs should be generated as soon as possible, and temporary repairs should be dated as a friendly reminder as to how long the temporary repair measure has been in place. Also, certain temporary repair materials should never be used on food processing equipment. Uh, duct tape, cardboard, uh, string, they shouldn't be used as they can degrade and uh, become a foreign material risk. Additionally, tape in uh, particular can easily collect allergenic debris and uh, become a cross-contact issue as well. So to summarize, uh, food processors are certainly under increased scrutiny to manufacture safe foods as foodborne outbreaks and recalls are still occurring. To tackle this challenge head on, uh, sanitary design should be looked at as a fundamental prerequisite program and processes should be regularly reviewed through feedback from inspections, from your personnel, and from an aggressive environmental monitoring program. Being actively involved with installers and equipment manufacturers on the specific needs of your facility uh, during the purchase of new materials or during renovations will certainly help to ensure that sanitary design is not overlooked. Uh, at the end of the day, incorporating sanitary design principles can certainly be an initial investment, but its return on brand protection is measured through the increased safety of the food manufactured at your facility as the equipment will be easier to clean and maintain. So thank you very much for your uh, time and attention. Uh, I certainly hope this presentation was beneficial. If you'd like more in-depth uh, content, our uh, web address is listed here in this slide. And now uh, this will open it up for questions. Yep, if you can uh, switch your webcam off, uh, Dan. S uh, super presentation, that. Really excellent. Um, very practical, um, as they say, a picture speaks speaks a thousand words. So there was uh, lots of great tips and uh, lots of the, the photographs really showed off uh, what you were uh, speaking about. So fantastic. Right. So shall we dive into the questions? Sure. Okay. So Robert Samudio, can you see that in the sidebar? Uh -huh. Does do spider webs in a food centered distribution? facility uh, affect the sanitation program, specifically says for F FDA? Um, spider webs are an indication that you certainly have some pest activity going on because what are spiders attracted to? Uh, insects. So um, you definitely want to uh, knock those down periodically and a, a good recommendation we actually give is to uh, when you knock it down to put some glue boards down because often those cobwebs are, are, are caused by cellar spiders and uh, when you're just uh, knocking it down you're just dislocating the spiders so really putting those glue boards down help to capture the uh, the pest of concern. Okay, uh, E-san. 
Cockroaches are always microbe carriers. Once pest infection occurs, particularly the cockroaches, what would be the best strategy for restaurants and catering services where operation continues around the clock? Uh, obviously, partnering with your uh, pest control provider, having one in place, uh, routinely communicating as well. You know, a lot of times when I do my inspections and we see pest activity or cockroach activity, uh, someone's certainly seen it. I mean, we're only there one day out of the year, so really communicating those issues, using your pest siding log, uh, having those detailed inspections occur uh, can really help uh, mitigate the issue. At the end of the day, it's all about communication. Uh, there's some really good uh, insect growth regulators out there, some really good cockroach baits out there, so you certainly want to get those issues communicated to your pest control provider. Okay. Pinky. What is the best floor material for a wet operation? Yeah, so those uh, those epoxy, those urethane coated uh, flooring uh, materials are certainly uh, durable and they stand up to uh, wet cleaning as well. But one of the considerations though you want to uh, think about is how much steam are you going to be using in your environment? If uh, you're going to be using a lot of steam, there's certainly a delamination uh, risk that could occur. So you'll want to work with uh, your, your flooring manufacturer, like we talked about in the slide. Let them know specifically what your operating parameters are, and they might even apply a, a thicker coating just to ensure that it doesn't become an issue. So. Okay, another question from Robert. Is it mandatory from the FDA to have an environmental and sanitation program uh, at a food distribution center? So this is a, this is a great question. Um, a lot of the times people look at the preventative controls rule and see a lot of uh, legal mumbo jumbo. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it all depends on what's your level of risk. If you're a fully enclosed uh, if you're just holding fully enclosed food products that are not exposed to the environment, uh, there's no risk uh, based on uh, the products you hold. But something you might want to consider is uh, exposed produce. Uh, if you look at some, some of the early uh, draft letters from the FDA seeking uh, comments from the industry, they do say that you know exposed produce is certainly a consideration, but when you do your risk assessment, the uh, likelihood of uh, requiring an environmental monitoring program will likely be low. Uh, so again, it just depends on your operation. It depends on your risk assessment. But generally, the answer would be no. Okay. Just before the next question, a couple of bits of feedback for you, Dan. Busy, very good webinar. And uh, Robert Samudio, AIB is the best company in training. Excellent <laughs> webinar. <laughs> That's great. Great, great, uh, to, great to hear that positive uh, feedback. Uh, that'll give you a boost to answer the next question. Uh, Ahmed, in food industry, are the rooms to be negative or positive differential pressure? Yeah, so uh, we talked about that in, a, in an earlier slide. Whenever you're in a, uh, whenever you're going from a, a raw area to maybe a, a high risk area, when you open that door to the high risk area, you should be feel air flowing out, which is also called a uh, positive pressure. So the reason for that is you certainly don't want air from the raw uh, area going over to the uh, ready to eat area because there's certainly an increased contamination risk there. Okay, uh, MD Nazir Hussain, how to control air contamination during pre-operational SSOP time? Um. Uh, again, you know, having making sure that you have those adequate filters in place for your supplier. But one of the things uh, we always look out when we're inspecting uh, in the industry is the use of compressed air. A lot of times we just say all you're doing is blowing the bacteria from one area of your facility to the other. So really, really, uh, when you're doing those uh, uh, cleaning operations, pay attention to how your personnel are doing the uh doing the cleaning procedures? Are they using high pressure water? You know, oftentimes we'll sit back and see how they're cleaning equipment. If they're using high pressure water and it's splashing off the floor and landing on equipment, or if they're using compressed air and blowing it to uh, another piece of equipment, it's really not that effective. So that'd be the advice I'd give on that. Okay. Um, Irina, it's a bit long and complex, well, for me anyway. Uh, hello, interesting presentation. Please advise what limits shall be followed for low risk and middle risk areas where the legal requirement says maximum 500 CFU 
stroke cm squared, but we usually achieve TNTC in the raw material defrosting area. Uh, I guess I'm a little confused by the question. Are they talking about air counts here? Are they talking about ATP swabs? Um, generally, you want to look at the risk of contamination. Like we said, if it's a raw material storage area, but there's no product exposure, uh, the likelihood of contamination may be low. But again, if it's somewhere where you're scaling, you know, maybe you're taking bags of ingredients open and dumping it, uh, certainly you want to uh, be a little bit more careful there. But really can't uh, answer this question without a little bit uh, further mm. information. And, you know, we're certainly here available. If you want to type up an email and send it over to us, we uh, have that uh, link on our slide there. So, Okay. Thanks, Stan. Uh, Elisa, is it possible for you to cite the CFR number for the poll question asked earlier on the recommended sample time of some several hours into production? So it's not actually in the Code of Federal Regulations, but it's actually from an FDA guidance document, uh, which is on controlling Listeria monocytogenes in your processing facility. So you could do a quick uh, Google search and uh, type FDA Listeria guidance document, and it, it talks about those parameters for uh, recommended sample times for your environmental monitoring program. But certainly we can share that uh, share that link as well if needed. So please feel free to reach out uh, uh, on that slide that, uh, that shows our uh, contact information. Okay. Isan, in the context of chillers and freezers, please specify sanitation standards in brief, specifically relating to cyto psychotrophic bacteria. Uh, again, it all depends on your level of risk, right? If everything's fully enclosed, you you still want to maintain a clean environment, but uh, don't really know exactly uh, what the product type you're storing, what the uh, what the building materials are. So everything kind of needs to be specifically tailored for your environment. So if anything, I would definitely work with your uh, chemical provider, see what they would recommend in terms of cleaning chemicals and uh, sanitation procedures on that because again everything is kind of specific to what products you carry and uh, what your operating environment is. Okay, um, you, you mentioned about temporary engineering is not desirable or should be done quickly and what materials not really to use but are there any good materials for temporary repairs? Yeah and certainly one of the first things we look at, at as auditors is that is there's a, a, a letter on file showing that that material is food grade. Uh, a lot of the times when you use duct tape, it's it's not intended for food contact surfaces, but there's certainly some uh, food grade Teflon tape, some food grade patching materials that you can certainly use, food grade epoxies. Uh, they're, they're out there. It, it just takes a quick Google search, and, uh, even uh, contacting your, your equipment supplier to figure out what's recommended. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Sharia. How much space uh, has to be kept between equipment and how fr how far from wall or floor to facilitate cleaning? Yeah, the ideal answer is as much as possible. But we all know uh, spacing uh, constriction certainly exists in the facility. So we recommend as a general guideline 36 inches. Reason being is you want to be able to squeeze your body back there in between the wall and be able to use those uh, uh, sanitation tools to do a detailed clean. Uh, in terms of the floor, uh, at least six inches off the ground uh, would be recommended. But if you can't keep the equipment off the ground, make sure it's sealed. You really don't want any splashback or any pests uh, to harbor underneath and become uh, become an issue there. Okay, thanks. Uh, Liz, um, yeah, do you have a checklist or know of a checklist on sanitary design? Uh, personally, I don't have one on me, but there's certainly checklists you can uh, you can search out there. There's GMA checklists. Uh, 3A dairy standards are also great for bakery equipment. There's uh, the bisque, the bisque checklist you can look at, look at as well. So, you know, again, all those materials we can certainly share uh, via web link. Okay. Uh, yes, everybody is being recorded. You get the slides and recording a couple of hours after the webinar. Uh, Noel. Um, are temporary fixes using woven bags a good food safety practice? Again, I guess it depends on the material. If it's in a product zone, uh, probably not likely, but if you're using it somewhere else, the risk may be low. But again, making sure it's a food-grade substance is the first thing you want to consider. And 
again, the location of where it's going to be used. I would say if it's a food contact surface, I would need a little bit more evidence that it's appropriate. And my initial answer would be no. Okay. Umea, how much time does it take for a biofilm to release microbes? And, and that, 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 that's the risk that we were talking about. Once that biofilm gets established, once it has that harbage area where we're not doing effective where the effective cleaning can occur, there's a consistent risk that that biofilm, as you can see in the, I don't know if we can go back in the slide, but you can see that when the biofilm has established itself, it's releasing cells uh, into the into the atmosphere, uh, into the environment. So uh, once it's established, it's consistently occurring. And that's why it's really important to get a handle on those resident microorganisms before uh, it contaminates your product. Okay, uh, so sort of two questions. Uh, I'll try and combine these two, Irina and Crystal, about cleaning electrical panels and generators. So uh, methods, you know, vacuuming, things like that, and what frequency should you be doing that type of uh, cleaning? Sure. Uh, dry cleaning is certainly effective, and, you know, the, the best approach is to be uh, preventative rather than reactive, so we always recommend it for those panels to be well sealed. When it comes to uh, cleaning frequencies, we recommend at least uh, on a monthly interval. On a monthly interval, the reason being is uh, usually from for eggs to develop into larva into adults, uh, you can break the cycle if, uh, if if you clean on a thirty day thirty day basis. So that's what we recommend. Okay. Um, well. Ora Beely is uh, sort of said, uh, would, is it fair to say that almost all of these, let's say, best practice would apply to the cannabis industry? Certainly, certainly. I mean, a lot of the times um, when it comes to food safety practices between the cannabis industry and the, uh, the food industry in general, the same principles apply. I mean, GMPs are certainly a foundation, uh, sanitary design is certainly a foundation for uh, food safety. So definitely take these principles in mind uh, when it comes to uh, the cannabis industry. Okay, uh, M. Lakshman, can you suggest some methods for high roof ceiling cleaning, high level cleaning? <laughs> sure, uh, at the end of the day, investing in some additional equipment, uh, scissor lifts, genie lifts, really getting that detailed cleaning done. Uh, a lot of the times when you're going up there, uh, you get one, better leverage on any cleaning brooms or, or vacuums you can use, but two, you'd be surprised uh, what you see. I mean, when we're going to bakeries and we climb, we use those scissor lifts. Uh, if they haven't been cleaned in a while, you'll see insect trails, you'll see larvae, you'll see flower beetles. So really, we recommend uh, investing in uh, some, some mechanical lifts to really do a detailed clean there. Okay. Uh, Don't blow it all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> no, not a good idea. Kiki, go. Uh, okay. Uh, what do you think about a coconut processing facility that has shelling and pairing area that is not meeting hygienic requirements, such as as presence of wood structures and ground that is not even cement, exposed raw coconut meat, but the product will eventually go through sterilization? That's uh, uh, kind of quite an interesting question um at the end of the day we always say once that material comes into your facility you're responsible to not contaminate it any further right so a lot of the times if we want to step away from that uh caveat oh well it's going to go through a metal detector later or, oh it's going to get sterilized later so that roof leak isn't really a big deal uh, going at that approach is really relying on the next step to eliminate the contamination rather than being proactive, which is what we were talking about with all these regula regulatory bodies is uh, really jumping ahead of the issue and not uh, allowing uh, your facility or structures to uh, cause contamination of the food product. Uh, I'm skipping past questions about TASIP and VASIP and things that are not quite uh, on topic. Um, uh, Chandra, what is the best chemical for floor cleaning? Uh, we actually have the next Food Safety uh, Friday seminar that uh, oh, yeah. should be covering uh, cleaning that uh, my colleague Megan will be uh, going right. over. So I'm kind of going to do a plug there for that. Okay, yeah, that's Wet Cleaning CIP uh, Cleaning Place, which is next Friday with Megan Coy. Um, but what kind of hand washing station used in a plant do you recommend? <laughs> Uh, again, it depends on level of risk, but certainly automated hand washing stations are preferred. A lot of the times when 
you're touching the hand washing sink faucet, your, your hands could certainly be contaminated. So making sure uh, an automated system would be preferred. Okay, just the last couple of questions now because we are way up. We, we are way up. I, I knew we would be, but uh, it's too good. We can't refuse. Roberto, I've heard that areas with colors are named according to the risk of the process. Is there any color classification for, for areas by FDA? No, no, there isn't uh, any uh, specific recommended color code guidance from the FDA other than, you know, again, just having those zone, uh, you know, as a good practice, having those. Uh, zone segregations clearly defined in your system. At the end of the day, it's important that your personnel know it. A lot of the times we'll go into a food plant and say, hey, what does green mean? Or, hey, what does yellow mean? Or, hey, what does white mean? So really making sure that your personnel understand not only uh, not only what the color code system is, but why it's so important is what we would recommend. Okay, super. Uh, Sujit, which standards references should we refer for sanitation, sanitary design? Uh, you know, like we talked about earlier, uh, for bakery equipment, you certainly have the, the BISCS standard you could look up. For dairy equipment, there's uh, 3A design standards. Uh, the Grocery Manufacturers Association has a great sanitary design checklist as well. Uh, the meat and poultry industry have checklists. So uh, there's a lot of tools and uh, checklists out there available for your use. So again, if you need that, we're certainly here to help. We can certainly share those resources. Okay, and uh, ESAN, sa sanitation standards, particularly for freezers storing raw meat and fish in the context of psychotropic bacteria. Yeah, again, I think this is a question we kind of touched on uh, earlier, but it depends on your environment, depends on your level of product exposure. I would definitely touch base with your chemical provider and see if there's any recommended sanitation procedures they would uh, suggest for those areas. Okay, right, that's it. We're going to have to stop. Uh, Daniel, uh, Dan, thanks very much. Uh, absolutely fantastic presentation. And uh, obviously, we'll be issuing that to everybody afterwards. So to, for them to take home, rewatch. I'll put the link in the follow up email to that uh, page on AIB. So if anybody does have further questions. But for you, the uh, first time you presented, how did it go? Did you enjoy it? Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, just technology nowadays is so amazing. And I, I thought the whole presentation and the, the setup was real slick. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I yeah, appreciate and, it. And thank you, Dan, and uh, AIB International. Okay, awesome. cheers, Dan. Have a good Happy weekend. Happy holidays, everyone. Take care. Okay, ladies and gents, I'm just going to – I will put the link to the certificate in the sidebar there. Um and I'll keep putting it in because it will disappear, obviously. It's scroll away. Um, that's the link to the certificate in Dropbox. You download the PNG. You sign it yourself or open it in an image editing package and type your name. We can't personalize them, obviously, because there's a, about at least 1,500 people registered for this webinar. So uh, thanks to Dan Wu. Thanks to AIB International. It's in it fantastic, eh? Uh, Food Safety Fridays. I love it. We've got one more next week for 2019. That's Wet Cleaning CIP with Megan Coy, again from AIB International. But we we're just finalizing the program for next year, and we've got uh, almost, I think, 30, um, 30 webinars next year. So we're not going anywhere. So uh, have a great weekend, everybody. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Friday. We'll see you next week. Take care. Bye.